What I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to talk about the U.S. economy, really kind of setting the stage of where we're at right now. Tough to make predictions, especially about the future. And if any time it was difficult to make predictions, it's in the setting today. Uh, and we'll talk about that, about how difficult it is, but we still have to. We still have to make choices. That's the crutch of it. Okay, so uh, we'll talk about inflation and labor markets. Cause, and you got to always keep in mind, while I'm doing this discussion, the labor markets and inflation, they're intertwined. They're both intertwined in terms of how the economy operates and also through policy, how we do policy. These are intertwined again. So we'll do that. Then we'll come over to economic outlook. I'll look at the, the U.S., Oregon, and uh, our research center, uh, which is Northwest Economic Research Center. Uh, please Google us. We've got lots of studies and so on that you can look at. We're very easy to remember. We're NERC, just one letter away from nerd. <laughs> okay? All right. And then I'll also have our uh, NERC forecast for Multnomah, uh, Clackamas, and Washington counties, uh, a broad overview. Then we're going to go into, uh, after the outlooks, we'll talk about recession risk. You know, is it going to happen? Is it not going to happen? What's the anticipation here? And then what do you do? Do, do you try to fight against, how, how can I insulate myself somewhat from recession? How can I fight it? Or, hey, roll over. It's the way it is. Just take it. All right. And now, now I have at the bottom here, housing is such a huge issue. And I have a little over 30 minutes today. And so I'm not going to go in depth into housing, but I'll touch on it, you know, a little bit as we, as we go along. All right, in the pandemic, uh, of course, we are um, hopefully coming to an end. Uh, as we take a look at the surges, you know, you had a surge here uh, back in November. Uh, this is in last November. You can see the seasonal surge is at least lower. Hopefully, we're coming to an end. Uh, I think as evidence of that, I don't see a single mask in the audience, right? Of course, I still wear a mask, by the way, whenever I go to the grocery store. Uh, but I think we're finally coming down to the end. The CDIC just had another booster, right, that we can do uh, coming up. So hopefully we're, we're at the end of this. And as a forecaster, this, this pandemic made absolute hell for forecasters. I mean, it's bad enough, like I said, Leo Gebert trying to predict what the future is doing, but we, we depend on trends. And then you have a pandemic? I mean, what, what history do I look at? You know, the Spanish flu back in the early 1900s or something, you know, to, to try to gauge. And so the data is absolute garbage. And we can't wait till this pandemic is over and we get some better data going forward that, that reflects behavior. All right, uh, GDP here. Um, and many of my slides will have this. The shaded areas are recession periods. All right, and notice this sliver <laughs> out over here. Two months was the uh, length of the recession. Since 1857, when they've been dating recessions, this is the shortest recession on record. The, the next shortest one was the early 80s, which was six months, but it was followed by a big, the big recession, right, of 82. And some people consider that just as one recession, which just had a little pause. So nothing historical matches what's going on there. One, another problem. So I say, I'm doing all these disclaimers, so in case I'm wrong, right, <laughs> it's OK. All right, these are quarterly. Uh, at annualized rates, you know, here it is, the big drop in GDP uh, on a, the second, uh, second quarter of 2020, and then the big bounce back almost immediately. And the other interesting thing on this, just to, to point out, is these are two negative quarters of growth, right? And the rule of thumb is if I have two consecutive downturns in growth in real GDP, that's a recession. That's a rule of thumb. No recession. So keep that in mind, too. You know, we're, we have some slowing in the economy, and we have aspects like this, but it takes more to have a recession than just real GDP. We look at employment. We look at all sorts of different measures, the housing markets, and so on. So keep that in mind, too, in terms of a slowing economy. 
Because that's going to be important, too, for when we talk about the labor market and talk about inflation again. All right, U.S. consumer spending. Really, I'm just showing this mainly for uh, the shift from goods to services. You know, the pandemic hits. All right, so what happens? Well, we got all sorts of restrictions. Restaurants are closed down. You can't get your hair cut. You can't, you know, go to the dentist. Medical facilities are down. Uh, and, and I'm at home. What am I going to do at home? Well, can I work from home? You know, I don't have a really nice desk at home. And uh, I need a better computer at home. Uh, so all of a sudden, the people are buying home office equipment, right? I can't go to the gym. Do you know how hard it was to buy a set of barbells? You know, you couldn't even find them anywhere, right? Everybody was doing a home gym. So, so, and then people were shopping. Of course, online shopping really went up. And goods buying really shot up. Services dropped. Now, as we start to lift restrictions and so on, we have a surge of pent-up demand for services, right? People going out to eat. God, I haven't been out to eat in, in a year and a half. This is great. All right, getting a haircut, going, doing, a, you know, a non-surgical medical uh, uh, appointments, dentist appointments. So we have a shift then into services and a shift out of goods. So as the goods, unfortunately, area, they have trouble when they're building things up, big demand, right? And then the demand drops off. Well, they're still up there trying to make more things and they can be hurt then, and their business slows down. So one of the things I'll, I'll talk about as a possible recession part, probably goods manufacturing is one of the areas that's going to get hit more so if we do have a recession than, say, the service sectors that still have some back pent up demand that people want to use it. All right, uh, this is year over year employment growth. Uh, and I have uh, the US. Oregon, and then the Portland metro area. Uh, and you can say we pretty much follow all the, the same amount. But you can see the drops here of uh, the blue is US, the red is Oregon, the green is uh, Portland metro. And this makes sense, by the way. You have a broad US, right? All sorts of manufacturing services are right. Well, you get a little bit more service concentration in the Portland metro area. You know, more hotels, more restaurants, you know, all those things that really got hit. And so the employment drops should be expected to be deeper for them. Uh, but then as year over year, we have a turnaround. And then the other point I want to show is, let me see if my little pointer, is really we're slowing down. We're slowing down in growth. Okay? And, right, the Federal Reserve likes that. Okay, unemployment rates. Same aspect, the unemployment rate hit higher. Uh, uh, actually, overall, for the US, it was higher than in Oregon and Port. But coming back down here, the other aspect is that right, the unemployment rate is ticking up just a little bit, just a little. Still, historically, quite low. But another aspect of a sign that things are slowing a bit. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about inflation now. This is inflation, the consumer price index, and then a very broad measure called the personal consumption expenditure. And we call that the core because it excludes volatile food and energy. And this is the preferred, in a sense, measure of inflation that the Federal Reserve uses. And their target is they want it to be 2%, maybe 2.5% if they want to be generous uh, in terms of where inflation should be. And you can see that, well, they're working, right? Hey, CPI is down. The uh, personal consumption expenditure, that's starting to come down. But you come across here, that's 5%. So it's still, it's softening. The inflation rate's coming down, but it's still too elevated. So, so we'll come back to to say, you know, what's the Fed to do if it's still too elevated? All right, just, just as a quick uh, example of, of the problems of inflation, I just picked out cars, used cars and new vehicles. You know, and uh, you know, this, is, this is an index. 
So the way to read the index is this is February of 2020, just as the pandemic is about to happen. Uh, and at an index of 100, anything out here that you read like this is, uh, you know, this is at 150. That means that from this February over to, you know, January, uh, that's a 50% increase in price. Huge, huge, right? And, and, and cars too. This is, uh, this is February of uh, 2021, February of 23. In two years, pretty much a 20% increase in price of cars, new vehicles on average. So that's tough. When you get these kind of prices are, you know, can people start to afford these things? Do they start buying less? Uh, inflationary expectations. Once again, very quickly. Peep, this is uh, from the University of Michigan. The expectation has come down of where they think inflation is going to be, but still the expectation is a little elevated. The Federal Reserve doesn't like that. They would like to get expectations down because what happens when you when you I expect inflation, I start acting differently, right? If I think prices are going to keep going up, then. And when I my goods, I put them on the market, I'm going to raise my price too, because I, I have to, because uh, all my costs are going up. And so it feeds on itself, on the expectations. So we need to break those expectations. Fortunately, the way the Fed generally does it, it takes a hammer and hits us over the head. All right. This one I have, and I just want to quickly show this. The point I want to illustrate is how strong personal income was as we got into the pandemic. And these spikes here, these are basically transfer payments. You know, the government paid people you know, money to try to keep the economy floating. Uh, and so personal income, very high. Now, we, over here, we have labor income is booming, household savings. Uh, this is an older slide. They are being drawn down now, but they're still at elevated levels relative to pre-pandemic times. Uh, asset values starting to come down a little bit, of course, but still not bad. Credit usage is low. That's starting to perk up a little bit, too. But the aspect here is that, you know, how do you feed the inflation monster? Well, if everybody has higher wages, higher incomes and so on, uh, and the prices go up, well, then they can buy those things at those higher prices. It's at some point as the inflation then has to be, uh, you know, keeping spending down is when people's incomes can't keep up or their wages can't keep up with the inflation. But they have been so far, but that's starting to change. And right now, they're starting not to be ke keeping up with it. Um, this is the federal funds rate and also the 30-year fixed mortgage rate. Um, and here, you know, the main point here is, you know, de the demand slows for credit-sensitive sectors. And two of the biggest ones is housing and autos. Um, and we're definitely, I think, seeing that uh, here uh, in housing. It is starting to slow some. Um, because, you know, as you have these elevated prices, uh, then all of a sudden, right, what matters to the person is, well, what's my monthly payment? And all of a sudden now, you know, can I afford that high monthly payment when those mortgage rates go up? It's tough. So if we get into a recession, and these, you know, what I'm saying is the ones that are going to get hit the most are, for example, the interest sensitive areas will be hit a lot. Remember, once again, Inflation, labor markets, they're interconnected. We had strong income growth. It's slowed, but still growing above trend. Uh, worker hoarding, you know. <laughs> I, I have people working for me. When someone leaves, I have trouble filling the spot. I'm gonna try to keep people working, even though the demand for my services or goods are are softening or going down, and maybe I don't need all those people, but you know, if I lose them. So this is my fear, is that with the worker hoarding, if we do get into a recession, because of the hoarding, it's going to be a bigger drop when it happens, rather than a trickle as the process is happening. But that helps keep inflation going, because people are still having the job and they're still making the money. 
China, uh, in terms of supply chain problems, uh, they finally are starting to uh, lift uh, a lot of their um, zero restrictions that they had. Uh, and so production's coming back at the same time. Uh, <laughs> we're worried about China. Uh, we don't want their electronics. We, you know, so there are still supply chain issues that politically, I think, we may be creating. Whether that's right or wrong, I don't know, but it, it is a problem. The, what fuels the inflation starting to run out? Workers, wage gains are starting to fall. Labor markets are starting to loosen up a little bit. Interest-sensitive sectors, right, are starting to see some slowing in their spending. Uh, supply chain issues are getting a little better. So those are all helping. I think that's part of the aspect of the inflation rate starting to come down. Supply chain issues are getting better and uh, we're having spending slowing because of the uh, interest sensitive sectors. All right, the Federal Reserve, um, they had a tough decision at the end of March. Uh, all of a sudden we have a possible banking crisis. You know, SVB, Signature Bank, you know, Republic, all these people are kind of in trouble. Uh, is it going to spread to all these other regional banks that are around, even community banks? Uh, so the feeling was the Federal Reserve caused the problem. Now, I'm not a big proponent of the devil made me do it argument. You know, oh, the Federal Reserve said I could hold these things, and I held way too many of them, long-term tr Treasury bonds, and ah, the Fed made me do it, and that's why SVP went under. I, well, I don't buy that. Anyways, so what does the Fed do? If, if they're raising the interest rates meant that, like an SVP that had long-term bonds, and those bonds, right, as the interest rate goes up, the bonds on their books go, value goes down. They're using those in terms of like reserves, like a, like a bank, you know, like capital or loan loss reserves, uh, and they have to book to market. They're not meeting their, right, requirements. Um, so does the Fed then say, okay, let's pause. We shouldn't, we don't raise them in March. Well, what, the inflation still elevated. If I don't raise them again, does the inflation get its toehold back in and does it stay elevated? Uh, what if I give up my fight on inflation? So, so I think what happened is the Fed decided in March, we'll do 25 basis points. Let's see what happens. No big calamity. So I'm convinced we're seeing another, early May, we'll see another rise in the uh, f federal funds rate by the Fed. Workers, where have all the workers gone? All right, this is from Indeed, uh, and these are job postings, once again, indexed. And you can see that the job postings went way up, right, 21, early 22. They're still at elevated levels relative to pre-pandemic. But once again, an aspect of some softening because these postings have just softened just a little bit. Wages, look at that, look at that kick in of wages. That's amazing, once again, Interaction, inflation, labor markets, right? How do you, you know, if I, if I see inflation happening, I'm a worker, and you're worried that your workers are going to leave, uh, they want a raise, you give them a raise. Their raise allows them to afford the higher price goods. The higher price goods can stay up because the workers can afford them. Uh, it's this circle, what we call cost plus, cost plus inflation. So, but notice, a little, little softening now on those wage interests. Still elevated because these are, these are growth in wages. So they're still at elevated levels, but there is some signs of some softening. This is the um, employment to population ratios for different age groups. It's a little different than labor force participation rates. Labor force participation rates means everybody in the labor force. If you're in the labor force, you are working or you are looking for work. Employment, you're employed. So, so once again, index just before the uh, pandemic and how this came down, the 65 plus group, really, because I think, you know, if you're 65 plus, you're really worried about getting COVID. And so you're going to move out of, the, of, of B, you know, you're going to quit your job or, or, or stay at home or whatever, right? But notice now we have bounce backs, we have things coming back here. Uh, and then finally, 
um, we're over to here, and the biggest group, 25 to 54, th they're back to pre-pandemic levels. The only two age groups are 65 plus and 20 to 24 that aren't back to pre-pandemic levels. And my, my guess is that the, the uh, 20, 24 year olds are living with the 65 year olds. <laughs> All right. But so once again, uh, you know, tight labor markets somewhat allevi alle being alleviated because we're getting back to these levels. All right, very quick here, way too much on one slide in terms of information here. The first point here really relates to as we started to get into the pandemic, really uh, uh, 20 to 22, uh, 2020 to 2022, where you know, we, had, we had great federal unemployment where at, for some people, you know, it was more than what they were making working. Uh, why work? Just logic, not being lazy or anything, it's just plain logic. Uh, schools, uh, right, uh, there weren't any uh, child care facilities available. What do you do when the schools are closed and, and the kids are at home? You know, one of the, one of the uh, you know, spouses has to stay home probably with the kids. So that took people out of the labor market. Uh, fear, right, of getting, of getting COVID. Now, it's starting to go away. The supplements ended last, uh, a, year, a whole, you know, a year and a half ago in September. Uh, schools have opened up in person, taking pressure off of the other in-person type things like child care. Uh, feeling safe in the workplace is getting a little better. But overall, uh, long-term demographics unrelated to COVID uh, are, are sh is shrinking the labor supply, right? And, and geezers still buy things, right? So you still have to make things, you still have to provide services. Um, and the other one is just a statement about COVID, right? We've got a lot more of the Greek alphabet probably to go through, more variants that may come up. That can cause labor problems. All right, so both inflation and labor markets, they're loosening up, but we still have some persistent problems with them. But they're slightly better than they were, say, a year ago. Okay, quick on the economic outlook here. Um, this is from professional forecasters. I didn't know that you, know, you could actually be a professional forecaster. Uh, but you know, they didn't take a survey of you know, the, the, the person who cuts your hair and ask them where's the economy going, right? These are people that do this day in, day out. So it's for the period 23, 26. Uh, they're, now, the other important that you have to keep in mind, when they did the survey, they did it in February, early February, before the banking situation came up, right? They're looking at unemployment levels going out, and they're looking at basically a soft landing, right? They're, they're looking at forecasters, they revise. So their forecast is around 40% chance that there'll be a negative growth in one of the, quarter, one of the next four quarters. Uh, so it's under 50%, right? But still a little elevated. Um, this is a, a, a busy uh, graph, but what I wanted to show you here for real GDP, you can see this growth, they've raised the growth forecast for uh, 23, lowered it a little bit for 24, pretty much the same going out. So all they did is they shifted and they're slightly more optimistic for GDP growth or the overall economy growth. Wall Street Journal survey. Now, this is a survey that came out in January. And of course, timing is everything. So they just released their April survey this Saturday. But I'll tell you what they said differently. But what they're looking at, notice, they see a down uh, quarter, uh, a drop in the second quarter, the one, the, the quarter that we're presently in. Uh, but look at this really anemic growth on either side, almost nothing, right? Very, very slow growth. Uh, inflation, they think it's gonna come down even further uh, quickly. Unemployment, rise, rise up a little bit, but not horrible. The 10-year note coming down, and the federal funds rate also starting to come down. Now, their outlook now, their release in April, 
what they basically have done is if you take their outlook, just take these numbers and shift them over one quarter. So now this quarter is really low growth, third quarter is negative, and this quarter is really low growth, and then the quarter after is low growth. And that's what you always do, right? When, when you're uh, not sure what's going on and you like your story, but you know, the tough part always in a forecast is I can tell you if a recession is coming, I can give you a date, I can't put the two together. And that's the tough part, <laughs> right? So what they're simply doing is just, okay, I, I know this is what's gonna happen, I, I'll delay it another quarter, I'll delay it another quarter. All right, and then their probability that there'll be a recession, the Wall Street Journal people, you know, mostly manic depressives, <laughs> you know, believe that the chances are greater than 50%, right, that there's gonna be a recession in the next 12 months. Their latest April forecast, I thought they were going to uh, raise this up. They stayed at 61%, they didn't change that. So they still think a recession's gonna happen in the next 12 months. So you got, you got the Philadelphia Fed that does a survey of professional forecasts, thinks soft landing. You got Wall Street Journal thinking, in a sense, hard landing. There'll be a recession. Okay, here's a sampling of US economic outlooks. Real quick here, uh, storm is a hard landing, uh, cloudy is a soft landing. And, and you have the conference board, uh, which is a uh, independent think tank, uh, they're the ones that put out the leading economic indicators. Uh, and then they think it's a recession coming. Uh, Duluth uh, has, well, it, it never really merits a recession, so they have a soft landing. Uh, then you have uh, the CBO, Congressional Budget Office. They also have a soft landing. And then S&P Global, uh, Standard & Poor's, they see a recession. So pretty much you've got all these groups. Someone says it's a recession, some don't. Who's right? Now, here's a slide, and this has gotten so much press. Not this particular slide, but, the, but what's happening in population, you know? And the controversy that's happening is that the Population Center at Portland State University, uh, which is the official census center, by the way, for the state, uh, they put out their own state forecast for population. And that is the population forecast that my old office down in Salem uses for their forecasting purposes. Now, the census put out their forecast for Oregon. And what we've got going here is the dark blue is Portland State, light blue is the census. And notice right here for 2022, uh, we have positive growth from Portland State, we have population loss from the Census Department. The last time we saw this actually was back in 1982. Where, but we also were in a horrible, horrible recession at that time. We're, we're not in a horrible, horrible recession this time. If population does, it follows the, the business cycle, right? This is the, the 2007 to 2009 you know, recession period and population lags a little bit in terms of how it reacts. And so, yeah, it, it follows the business cycle. We have a slowing down that's occurring in the economy, okay? We had the recession in, in 2020, uh, the two-month recession. So, yeah, maybe, you know, that would affect population growth, but not, you know, it, it was over, you know, really quick, uh, but we're having a drop. So this is what people are really asking us, what's true? Uh, I've got some notes here. Uh, one of the things they look at, at at the state is what about the driver's license surrendering, right? Because if you move to the state, you got to eventually get an Oregon driver's license. So one of the measures of in-migration is, well, how many surrenderings are we getting? It's a little tough. You have to stretch it over several months and get, take an average because you don't know if the Department of v Motor Vehicles is holding back and then they report like two months all in one month. So it really, you know, so you got to take a good average, but it's relatively strong. I mean, people are still coming in. So there's some aspects we believe that possibly Portland state numbers may be a little more right than what the census is having. All right. But it's very important because, you know, that's what makes us grow. This is what allows us to grow faster overall than the U.S. does. 
We tend to have a stronger population growth that allows us workers to come in. If we have expansion periods, we can expand faster, uh, you know. So we have to watch that very carefully. Uh, our forecasts. Uh, this is from a, the national forecast comes from uh, IHS Market, which is a national forecasting firm that the state uses. Then there's the state forecast, and then for the Portland metro area, uh, which is the uh, grayish, that comes from the NERC people. Uh, and you can see the U.S. forecast from the National Forecasting Service has a recession, because this is our zero line, and it's negative. The state and NERC both have pretty much a soft landing, all right? But very little growth coming out here. That's part of it because, you know, it, it, we're trying to just do an average. The, getting the wiggles in are almost impossible to do. And then this is for Clackamas, uh, Multnomah, and Washington counties. Uh, Multnomah rising a little bit higher than Clackamas and Washington. Uh, you can see the dips that actually, these are actuals over here. Washington County didn't quite dip as much. These are employment numbers uh, as the other two counties. But once again, just here, you can see that just, just brushing up to almost negative. So is it going to be a recession, not a recession? What signs can we look for to help us tell us? Right? And do we need to run to higher ground? Okay, four competing scenarios. The hard landing, the Wall Street Journal people, right? There's going to be a recession. Soft landing, a slowdown, definitely, but no recession. There were people out there last, last uh, December, even last January, that had a no landing. Heck, we're set for growth again, taken off. And then the got it recession. You know Samuel Beckett play, waiting for got it? This is like the Wall Street Journal people. They're waiting for that recession. They keep moving it. Yeah, it's going to happen in the next six months. Six months happens, no recession. Oh, it's going to happen in the next six months. And so this is the, you know, chicken little, the sky's falling people. Uh, these people think, you know, there's not going to be any recession. I don't know if it's slow or nothing, but don't stop predicting it. Now, from NERC, we're going to add one, and I didn't put it on writing because I don't want to be held to it. <laughs> uh, we're going to call ours a firm landing. Now, what I mean by a firm landing, it's somewhere in between a hard landing and a soft landing in that possibly overall we don't lose total employment, but we're going to have sectors that do and sectors that don't. On net, it's basically almost a zero effect. But it's still going to be not a soft landing. It's going to be a little bit hard landing for some of the sectors in, in the Oregon economy and in our local economies here. Now, um, and I should, actually, there should be a, 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 another one up here for the Federal Reserve. Given the Federal Reserve's history of trying to engineer a soft landing, what they really should just simply say is, any landing you walk away from is a good landing. <laughs> the plane is crashed, it's burning, I'm walking away with a limp, but I'm still alive to live another day. And, you know, so I don't have a great faith in them engineering a soft landing. All right, this is the Wall Street Journal. Um, and what I want to point out and how quickly views can change. Recessions do come upon us pretty quickly in terms of people seeing them. Is that here, January 22, 18% chance of a recession in the next 12 months. One year later, 61% chance. Just in a year's time, that flip-flop. So, you know, if you didn't see it coming, don't, you know, don't feel bad. All right, uh, how do we know a recession's coming? Uh, we have a leading index from, uh, of the U.S. from the conference board. We have a leading index for Oregon from the Philadelphia Fed. And look at that, suspended indefinitely. What pansies. <laughs> you know, it's too difficult to do, so they're not doing it. And so they just, you know, so I, I have question marks for what Oregon. But notice the leading index jumping up to 2022. 
So, so you can see now the people that said, you know, no landing, right? We, maybe we're getting back to growth. Look, leading indicators are going up. But now they've dropped right back to where they were before pretty quickly in, in one year's time. Uh, they've been down now. Uh, the six-month percentage change is down 3.6%. Uh, really, they, they believe it's due to the interest rates paired with uh, declining consumer spending. Uh, and they think, the conference board, it's going to be a recession near term. They have a hard landing look because of they're following their leading economic indicators. The interest rate yield curve, the inverted yield curve, right? Well, it inverted uh, January 6, 2022. And it's still negative as I was making up these slides on April 6th. So that's quite a ways time at <laughs> the inverted. I'll have a chart in a second there. Uh, so anyways, I just really wanted to say the bottom line here, there's no sure way to see a recession is coming, unfortunately. Not much comfort in that statement. Doesn't mean you can't do something about it when it does come or if you think it's coming. Uh, conference board, you can see leading economic indicators do a pretty good job. Falls, shade is recession. Falls, shade is recession, right? Not too bad. But look at these. These are probably what? False signals. All right, in here. They've come down, but no recession. They were slowing. But now look, see what we've had. We have, of course, that very small recession, short recession. I shouldn't say it was small. Uh, and now the leading indicators are way down. So that's why they're saying, look, based on this, I think a recession is definitely coming. Inverted yield curve, a somewhat more reliable actual measure. You can see the yield curve is negative here, and then what it's followed, recession. Negative recession, negative recession. We dipped here just for a moment, right, into negative, uh, and then, of course, the very short recession. But look how deep this one is uh, in terms of the inverted yield curve. That, that is, right, Treasury security minus the two-year security yields. Short-term rates are higher than long-term rates. What, what, what's going through financial markets' minds? Well, there's going to be a recession. And we have the short-term rates are elevated because the inflation rate's up. But longer term, the recession will happen, inflation will come down, and right, the inflation premium on rates will come down, the long term rate will be lower. So, and if they are thinking this way, remember, expectations, I start to act that way. I think a recession is going to happen. What do I do? Do I lay off workers? Do I? But then again, do you are hard workers because <laughs> labor is fine. It's a difficult time. All right, let me quick get out of here. Just the Dow Jones Industrial Average is not a good predictor. It's a coincident indicator of recessions. All right, industries impacted. I really think uh, the, all of them are going to be slowed down, but some are slowed down more than others. And so I really think those on the left there are going to be more impacted. Uh, you know, construction, of course, is an uh, interest sensitive uh, industry. Um, manufacturing. Uh, trade, transportation, utilities, wholesale. We're already starting to see some slowing in wholesale. This is some of the spending slowing. I think retail will down mostly flat. Uh, financial activities uh, mostly flat, but depending on what type of financial activity you're involved. Uh, I, I think in the, the people definitely tied directly to the housing market in terms of financial markets will see more of a hit than those that are not. Uh, information is uh, uh, publishing type people. All right, but then usually leisure and hospitality should get hit in a recession. You know, they should get hit, but there's pent up demand still for, for, you know, for hotels, restaurants, you know, all of that. So the services, I think, will be relatively better off, slowed, but better off if we have a recession. Headwinds and tailwinds, you know, the, the, the one we're really adding in here you know, is a possible banking crisis. You know, and the tough part here is, um, you know, interest rates are up. Banks now, especially a lot of the regional banks, and when the interest rates are up, you know, what do you do? Well, you know, I, I have an account at OnPoint Credit Union. And I look to see what they're paying me on my, you know, my checking account balance. Uh, maybe I should go over to Morgan Stanley. 
And a lot of people are thinking that. And if I'm a little risky because I see this horrible news about banks and oh my God, I'm scared. Uh, banks now need liquidity. And by the way, if you, any of you are bankers here, and if you're, I was a director of the Federal Home Loan Bank of Seattle and involved actually in the merger with the Federal Home Loan Bank of Des Moines. And for you, you know, that is a great, from my experience, a great source for liquidity is the Federal Home Loan Bank. And they're there and they think they give reasonable rates. So that's something that you want to keep a good, good ties with. But, you know, w with this happening, uh, uh, banks now, they were flush with money from the pandemic and so on. They're not so flush anymore. They've got to have liquidity needs. Uh, they're getting a little shy in making loans. Both for if you're wanting to expand, some you said, well, you might be in a position, right? Even though it's slowing down, you've got good management, you've got a good business model, you know, you want to expand, it's a little tougher. And those that, that depend on lines of credit to keep businesses going and so on, all, you, know, you tell the banker, it's that much now? So, tough, that's, that's the one that can really, I think now, if we're getting recession, besides the Federal Reserve, and you know, th that combination can kind of push us, I think, into recession, or at least damn close to it. Uh, work from home is definitely a wild card. Um, notice that it says here, you know, one in three workers can kind of work from home. Uh, is this to stay? And then also local areas. I mean, what happens to suburbs? You know, their, their economy almost starts to change the way they look, the, the businesses they might be doing. And if we have the uh, exodus from uh, downtown Portland into suburb areas, uh, that, that changes a lot of the economic environment in places like here. All right, and they're very quick. This is from uh, uh, Cushman and Wakefield, uh, office space. Uh, you can see this is just the Portland market, and you can see that line that, especially for office, industrial not so bad, but the vacancy really going up uh, in the Portland downtown area. All right, what can you do? Just common sense. These are things you should think about anyways, even if there's not a recession coming. But, you know, are you a worker hoarder? You know, if, if you're starting to have, if a recession's coming, uh, you know, how long can you uh, bleed cash? Um, at some point, you know, it, once you start to see your business slowing down, at some point, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking, absolutely. You know, I, I, in the uh, research center I had at Portland State, you know, if we didn't have bucks coming, we were self-sufficient, by the way. The, the university only gave us an office and a phone. That was it. Um, you know, if you didn't have money coming in the door, you couldn't hire graduate students. You know, you had to let them go. It was heartbreaking. And that's just tough. So you're going to have to think about it. Make or buy. This is a standard question, right? Almost any MBA program. You know, do I internalize and make the part for my good, or I provide the service, or do I buy it in the marketplace? Right? And so, you know, you want to have that flexibility, because if your business is starting to slow down, you may find that it's cheaper to buy the part or something you have in your manufacturing process or some aspect of your service that you do is to outsource it. All right, so you want to think about that. We've already talked about taking your banker to lunch, right? And at now, you know, you may have to take your banker to dinner too or take them, <laughs> or take them on a cruise or her on a cruise, right? Because you want to stay in good, good, good. Uh, and then for those, you know, that, that own their own businesses, especially, you know, can, ma top, can management take a pay cut if, if things are slowing down? You know, if you're really worried about losing key employees and you want to try to keep them, how do I do it? How do, what about the cash bleed? Maybe this is a time we have to take a break. All right. More long term, do you need all that office space? I think, is, it, is work from home truly here to stay? Has is, is that been a real game changer uh, because of the pandemic? We were, all, we were moving in that direction and then shoved into it, right, because of the pandemic. Location. I mean, God, if you look for work from home and all this, where, where do I need to have my, my business uh, located? And, and, you know, and really, I am very worried about Portland. Uh, I mean, just REI just announced that they're closing their Portland store. Uh, Walmart uh, is closed. 
Now, hey, you Lake Oswego people better be worried. Walmart may decide, well, if I close the port, maybe I can open one in Lake Oswego. I, I know that's not probably a popular uh, proposition for Lake Oswego people. And I know you Lake Oswego people, you know, you, 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 got, you got I-205, right? You, you got, you got to tolls that may come, what's that gonna do? You don't like phone cell towers. Uh, you know, you don't like people going in the lake. I mean, you got all sorts of problems. <laughs> you know, it's bad enough, right? That you gotta do all of this. All right, so what, the idea here, and, and I, I really wanna put a, a, a plug out to uh, my colleague, Bill Connerly, who's spoken here. He has a nice little book, a little somewhat dated, but very relevant for right now, called The Flexible Stance. And I highly recommend that you look at that because it really is a book about if you're a business, what, what do you do when, when you have a recession? How do you control on it? But I really think common sense, these top four here are ones you really should think about. So you gotta make a choice, right? Hopefully when you make a choice, you're gonna do better than Yogi Berra. I thought it was funny. <laughs> All right, well thank you.